on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Tonight on Piers Morgan Uncensored, Lynch the Grinch strikes again and takes 40,000 of his union members with him. Rail strikes cause chaos across Britain and there's more to come. I'll talk to a militant union boss about the strikes that are cancelling Christmas. The truth or their truth. The California mudslingers have taken over their families, the palace and the press and their Netflix wine -a Everyone, of course, but themselves. Tonight, the reality star who had a fling with Prince Harry reveals to me how she's now been airbrushed from his history. One of the most beautiful classical pieces of music ever written should be now be boycotting it and Tchaikovsky because it was written by a Russian composer. I'll speak to the Ukrainian culture minister asking us all to do just that. Live from London, this is Piers Morgan Uncensored. Well, good evening from London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Britain isn't feeling very festive this Christmas. It's more a case of no, no, no than ho, ho, ho. Feels like we're living in a country in constant decline. War in Europe has brought tragedy to our doorsteps and rocketing bills to our doormats. Families are being paid to turn off their power just to prevent blackouts. Millions of people can barely afford to keep it switched on in the first place. Eye-watering inflation is taking more money out of people's pockets with every passing month. Supermarket prices are soaring just as we're sucked into what could be an historic recession. Now, austerity is looming, compounded by a mismanaged Brexit that's bringing disasters rather than dividends. And far from providing answers and leadership, our politics is paralysed by perpetual chaos. Five education secretaries, four chancellors, three prime ministers in a year. The Conservative Party's been in power for 12 years, and even to many of its own supporters, it now looks punch drunk, out of ideas and on the ropes. And as a result, trade unions can smell blood like vultures around a rotten carcass. And with a wave of winter strikes worse than anything we've seen in many decades, they're trying to land a knockout blow. Mick the Grinch Lynch of the RMT is the flag bearer for Britain's strike chaos. 40,000 of his rail workers are walking out this week. He refused to be interviewed by me today, as he has done for many weeks. Uh, following a series of cantankerous car crash interviews he conducted this morning, we found out why he's got so camera shy. You are robbing them of their income for the coming year. Many of them are saying they're going to go bust. Well, we're not targeting Christmas. This is, it isn't Christmas yet, Richard. I don't know when your Christmas starts, but mine starts on Christmas Eve. We understand the anger that's caused by the disruption of the, of the stoppages, of course. Um, but we are getting a lot of support from the public. We continue to get messages. People continue to visit our picket lines. And what businesses ought to be asking the government is why are they subsidising this strike? You're just parroting the most right-wing stuff that you can get hold of on behalf of the establishment. And it's about time you showed some partiality towards your listeners and to working-class people in this country. Of course, a lot of working-class people have been directly impacted by these strikes. Mick Lynch hasn't got any answers. It's not right-wing, it's not an establishment cover-up. Public support for these strikes is evaporating because people are angry. And they're angry because it feels like Britain is falling apart and we're all being held to ransom now by these union bosses. Nothing seems to work anymore. Bus drivers, postal workers, nurses, highway controllers are all set to strike this week. The army is preparing to cover border security at airports. Taxi drivers could be used to cover ambulance strikes over Christmas. Britain has become a paralysed laughingstock, and we all deserve better. We've had enough, haven't we, of all this chaos and this decline? We've certainly had enough, I think, of the people who have been putting us in this position. And it's time, as a country, we started fighting back. Well, in a moment, I'll speak to the former Assistant General Secretary of the RMT, Steve Headley, uh, because the current one won't come on. But first, the boss of the Public and Commercial Service Union, Mark Sawatka, which represents border force workers who are striking over Christmas. Mr. Sawatka, just before I came on air tonight, um, interesting development in the nurses' strike, where the UK's chief nurse has actually challenged now the position of the RCN, the Ming uh, Nurses' Union, warning that patients' lives are being put at risk by these strikes which are being planned by nurses. That is the first, I would say, dramatic uh, example of a workforce now realising 
the dangers of these strikes. What do you say to that? Well, I'm not, I'm not here to talk about the health service, peers, other than to say I fully support the right of all nurses to take industrial action, as I do all workers, because the blame for all of this should be squarely laid at the government's door. They've caused the cost of living crisis. They've doubled our mortgages. They've sat back and done nothing. And what we're doing in trade unions now, when members of our unions are voting, in my case, with an 86% majority to strike, is saying we're going on strike because it cannot be right that the government is cutting everybody's pay in real terms and we deserve a decent pay rise. OK, you say you don't want to talk about nurses, but what the chief <coughs> nurse of this country is saying is that if this industrial action happens with the nurses, and I accept it's not your direct responsibility, but if it happens, if they <coughs> go on strike, she is worried that patients' lives will be put at risk. In other words, people may die. Are you comfortable with that, that industrial action could lead to people in this country dying? Well, I put the blame squarely on the, in, the, in the government's court because the nurses' leaders have made it clear they would not proceed with industrial action if the government agreed to talk about their pay. That's an entirely reasonable position, and the people who are worried should be contacting Richie Sunak, Jeremy Hunt and Steve Barkley. They have the power to stop all of these strikes by being prepared to negotiate on pay. They should do that in the health service. They should do that for the people I represent in the civil service, 40,000 of whom, by the way, peers, are using food banks, 45,000 of whom who work for the government claim in-work benefits because they are the working poor. If the government says we won't talk about pay, industrial action is the only last resort that we now have left, and that is why members are voting in huge numbers to go on strike. They'd rather not go on strike, but frankly, if the government... I'm not prepared to okay, negotiate. Do you believe, do you believe as, a, as a starting point of principle for any negotiation, that everyone who's currently going on strike or about to go on strike should get a pay rise at least equivalent to inflation, if not more? Nurses want 19%, for example. Should they all get at least the equivalent of inflation? Yeah, my opinion is every working person, every woman and man, has the right, when they go to work, to ensure their living standards don't drop. If your pay rise is less than the rate of inflation, you are having a pay cut in real terms. And for the people I'm representing, we've had that for 10 consecutive years. Now with this cost of living crisis, the 2% we're being given when inflation at 11% is not only the lowest pay offer anywhere in the economy, it is frankly absurd. And the government know that, and that's why the industrial action is taking place. You see, I think it's perfectly possible to have a lot of sympathy for everyone is going on strike because cost of living crisis is very real and is really impacting people. It's also possible to see there is clearly a joined up concerted effort now by union leaders to get together to bring this government down. And it's also clear that if actually you all genuinely believe that all these strikers should get, all your members should, from everyone, should all get at least uh, in line with inflation as pay rises, this country will go bankrupt. Now, I can... And I would add a fourth point. It's also possible to believe we're in this miserable position because the government's been hopeless. All those things can be true. Uh, but your responsibility is surely to get a fair and balanced pay rise for your members without actually imperiling the very economic stability of the country, isn't it? I mean, why would you want to behave as badly as you claim the government's been behaving? Well, I certainly agree that the government's hopeless and the sooner they go, the better. Um, my job is not to bring down the government, but it is to get the government to recognise that when 40,000 of its own workforce, the people who work in job centres, for example, have to claim the benefits they administer, something is wrong. And when you've had 10 years of pay rises less than inflation and you get to a cost of living crisis, if the government is saying that's tough, then we have to do something about it. Now, we want a 10% pay rise. That's our claim. But what we've said to the government is if they are prepared to say now they have money, they will put money on the table. We've made it clear we will get into negotiations with them about how much that is and how it's distributed. Their answer is not a penny will be put on the table. Therefore, all we can do is either sit back and accept that our members will have the worst Christmas in living memory, many of them not only claiming um, benefits and using food banks, but struggling to feed themselves. OK, let if me ask you, look, you, you keep referencing people who have to use food banks. I've heard this a lot in this debate. How, if, if you don't mind me asking you, actually, I don't care if you mind or not, how much do you earn? 
Well, I earn considerably less than you, Piers. Um, how how but much what do you I earn? earn what, what I earn is a matter of public record. My salary is £97,000, set democratically by my union. And what are, the, what are the perks on top of that? There are no perks on top of that. So your total remuneration is 97000 I receive £97,000. Uh, that is a public record. My pay rise every year is linked to the rise that our members get. And the question isn't here. I so you want I'm about what? Well you want like a, a ten thousand pound pay rise for yourself? No, I uh, I have accepted. In when our members receive zero percent, I receive zero percent. Yeah, but right this now you say you want you want a pay rise in line of in, with inflation for your members. That would be at the moment around ten percent. So you would get about ten grand. You accept that? No, I don't accept that. No, because if we were to achieve a ten percent pay rise. In my own union, for three consecutive years, the most senior staff in the union took no pay rise whatsoever and donated their money back to the union strike fund. So would you do but that in this eventuality? Would you refuse to accept oh, if, the pay rise? I'm, I'm more than happy to say if our members got a 10% pay rise, I would happily forgo that and put it in the strike fund. Because our members who pay benefits, who keep the borders open, who keep the courts running and the prisons running, are poor peers. Their average wage is £23,000 a year. The government has given them 2%. I don't think you believe 2% is realistic. It's less than anyone else is being offered. It's less than the 6.2% average earnings in Britain. It's less than any other part of the public sector has been offered after 10 years of pay cuts. So what we're doing now by going on strike is saying to the government, they either put money on the table or they should take the blame for the disruption that is coming. And more than that, and I'm quite happy to say it on your show, Yes, of course, we are talking to union leaders in every other union, and there's about 30 whose members are also doing the same thing, because if the government is the cause of everyone's problems, then it's only right that we work together to try to get the government to see sense. Okay. And I believe civil servants deserve a pay rise, but so do rail workers, train drivers, lecturers, postal workers. Every working man and woman deserves to go to work to be better off each year, not get real. Yeah, I people. listen... I can agree with the sentiment, except we are in the middle of an unbelievable financial crisis where if we give everybody the same rate of inflation as a pay rise, the country goes bust, which is completely irresponsible. So there has to be a meeting ground which does not involve everyone getting uh, inflation because if they do, we, we can't afford it. So that's where we are. And it can be down to incompetent government. It can be down to everything. But I just don't think the union leaders holding out for that as their yardstick are doing the country any favours either. But I've got to leave it there. Well, I, um, thank no, you. I I've think got to leave it there. Every, Mr. Well, every union leader has made it clear they'll get into talks if more money's on the table and the government okay. can afford it. They Mr. Craft so what, I've heard you loud and clear. I appreciate you joining thank me. You. Thank you very much indeed. Joining me now is the former Assistant General Secretary of the RMT, Steve Heddy. We wanted to have the current one, uh, Mick the Grinch, but he uh, was not available. Um, the union decided to get into a Twitter uh, Barney with me for most of the day, which seemed a, a pretty useless uh, way to spend their time in the middle of this crisis. But anyway, Mr Headley is with us. Thank you for joining me. Um, currently, the oh, RMT is paralysing the country. Why? Well, quite simply because the pay offer has been made over two years. It's 5% uh, this year and 4% next year. It was in real terms a 12% pay cut because inflation is 12% this year and at the very best is forecast they fall to 8% next year. It could be higher than 8%. Now, a deal's been done in Scotland, Piers, I don't know if you know about this, but um, a deal's been done in Scotland where people got 5% plus a £750 bonus and that was a one-year deal. And uh, there's going to be no job cuts and there's going to be no extra shifts, work extra nights or extra weekends. So that's uh, why the RMT are basically out there having this uh, battle, uh, which I fully support. They're out there defending jobs, defending safety on the railway, and demanding uh, that people catch up with the inflation that's been driven by excessive profits, been driven by oil prices, been driven by food prices. It's not been driven by wages. And people need a pay raise. Do you think the negotiations between union leaders and the government should be done in a civil way? Well, I would hope so, but, I mean, that takes two to tango, doesn't it? I mean, I think that um, when, when you've got ministers making it clear that they've, they've not got anything to offer, uh, but they're still, you know, uh, saying that they want talks, well, what is the point in having talks if you've got nothing to offer? Surely the point of having talks is to reach a compromise. Now, I think that um, 
They, there's been eight weeks now when the RNT hasn't been on strike. That time could have been used productively by the government to get round the table. I mean, I, I think a deal in Scotland is a, a, a terrible deal, by the way. Uh, that's my personal opinion, but our members accept it and I accept that. So if it's good enough for people up in Scotland, why is it not good enough for people down here? And I would kind of reiterate Mark's point about the, the nurses. These are people that haven't been on strike in 106 years. And the government are even refusing to talk to them at all about pay. Now, all this happens in Scotland is the Scottish government, and I'm no fan of the SNP, but the Scottish government said, we'll talk to you about pay. And they called the strike off. If you're, I let think me ask you this, though. Right, but that, 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 the reason I asked you about civility... You know, you want to get in the room with people. Mm. I accept you're not the leader anymore. Mm. Uh, but you were suspended by the RMT because you said, and I remember you doing this, and I remember feeling incensed when you did it, that you would throw a party if Boris Johnson died of coronavirus. Why, if you're in the government, would you want to get yeah, in the well, room? Yeah, well, I wasn't... Well, you did say that. Why would you, why would you want to get well, in the well, room if wasn't, you're the well, government I, I, with people I wasn't, that I wasn't that involved in any dead? phone hack and Pierce, and I wasn't... A... I wasn't a serial adulterer, Pierce. And so if you're going to play the moral guardian, I think you want the... I'm not the, playing uh, any moral guardian, Mr Edley. I'm asking you... Take, you, take the log, I'm take the log you, out of your own eye. Take I'm the log asking, out of I'm your own eye. I'm simply asking you... If we look at the if you think Ryan, it's, if you, I'm simply asking you a question. I know so this you, is your you technique on, with all you journalists. Come on here, you, ask you, you come on here. I'm asking you a question. You come on um, here making childish jokes about Mick the Grinch. Yeah. And you talk I'm about asking civility. you whether you think it's You're right an and proper absolute disgrace. to get people into You're like a, a room who said you wanted Boris Johnson to reaction. die of coronavirus. Well, I'm not, I'm not in the room. I'm gone. I'm not there. Mm. Mick Lynch hasn't said that. But you were suspended, so, and that shows back, an attitude way, back, of back mind, yours, doesn't it? Back, it shows an back, attitude back, of mind. Well, back to, yours, back to your serial adultery, Pierce, which has been well documented. Back to the allegations of phone tapping. Who are you to play the moral guardian? I'm not can the one leading the this country well, into actually, a crisis this we, winter. You we, are. You and your team. Well, well, well neither am I. And the clue, the clue is, and right, the so ex I think you've done this with people Pierce, before. We, the look, ex. We know, what, yeah. we know you like to play whataboutery. I'm simply asking you, what does it say about well, the state of mind well, of people you, running these unions if you were suspended by the RMT for literally wishing Boris Johnson to die of coronavirus. I'm simply asking you whether you well, think that is the right way for union bosses to behave. But there, but there, there we go. Well, I don't think it's right that uh, highly paid um, reporters such as yourself, serial All right, you're not going to answer the question. People have All been right. involved allegedly. Thank you very much, Mr Hedley. I appreciate you joining me. Tapping. Try answering a few questions next time yourself. Coming next as the palace braces itself, the next instalment of Harry and Meghan's Netflix series. I'll talk to the reality star who had a fling with Prince Harry and said she didn't recognise the party prince she once knew.
Welcome back to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Still to come tonight, should we be boycotting Tchaikovsky just because it's Russian? I'll talk to the Ukrainian culture minister who says the West should boycott all Russian culture until the end of the war. But first, the Duke and Duchess of Montecito said they've never had an opportunity to tell their story until their $88 million Netflix series. And if that isn't enough, there's also Prince Harry's autobiography, Spare, or Spare Me, as we've renamed it, to look forward to next month. Well, far from not having the opportunity to tell their story, I don't think anyone else in history has had more opportunities than these have done, each time for vast amounts of cash. But how accurate is their truth? Well, a reality star from The Real Housewives of DC, Kat Omine, who claims she... well. She did have a flick with Prince Harry, doesn't claim anything, it was true. Says she's been whitewashed from history and doesn't recognise the party prince she once knew. Kat joins me now along with Royal Correspondent of Vanity Fair, Katie Nicholl, and Fox News contributor, Geraldo Rivera. Welcome to you to this uh, stellar panel, I must say. Hey, Pierce. Um, and thank you, uh, Geraldo, for joining us from across the pond. I'll come to you in a moment. Kat, I want to talk to you because this book that's coming out, Spare, is supposed to be Harry's story. But I suspect we're going to get a very sanitised version of anything which is awkward for him, and it'll just be more of what we've been seeing now for the last year and a half, which is just constant attacks on his family and the media. Or a total snooze fest. Right. I mean, you know, the, the, but the title, I love the title of the thing, it's a great title, but, you know, how much he's influenced about how he wrote it and what's in it, who knows? You were 34 when you met a yes. young 21-year-old Harry. Yeah. So a bit of a, a Madonna situation going on there. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, she likes the toy boys, doesn't she? Well, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I was, I was criticised because I didn't really care about age. You had a little fling with him. Yeah. Uh, it was well documented and we got pictures of you there. What was he like then, as a young guy? Just really, really, really funny. A total gentleman, totally down-to-earth, normal. And Did he carry any of this enormous baggage which he now appears to have all the time? Because he seems just completely miserable. He did at the time. Well, he seems miserable No, no, now. I mean, now he just seems completely miserable all the time. This freedom he saw doesn't seem to well, make him yeah, remotely well, happy. Well, I mean, what I saw of him at the time, he was desperately searching for freedom and, and privacy, and yet what he's done is completely turn the whole situation full circle. Right. And now he's got no privacy... And no freedom. Well, they invade their own privacy every 10 minutes. That's the sort of irony of this position. I mean, Katie, we, we've talked a lot about this. Um, and the reason we keep talking about it is because on Thursday, there'll be another dump yep. of three more episodes <laughs> yeah. in this Netflix snooze fest, which a lot of it is very boring. You stay but awake it, for it. Well, yeah, it is boring, actually. It's very self-indulgent, very narcissistic. But in the middle of all this, there will be more barbs we know at the royal family and at the, the media. media. You know, we'll, and they'll we'll play the oppressed the victims. Home. They will. It's really interesting hearing Kat say that, actually, because I think when you look at those pictures of Harry partying, and I started my career as a royal correspondent because I ended up at a party yeah, with Prince Harry that. and, you know, drinking a bottle of vodka and having a great time, and he seemed like a very fun guy. But it's interesting hearing you say that he seemed like someone that sort of wanted to, to hide away from, from the media, who wanted to have his private life, and I think that is the massive contradiction in, in all of this. But as I unpick his, his complaints and this resentment, and it, it's bitterness. At the heart of this is bitterness about the institution, bitterness about how he's portrayed in the media. And I think now that he's actually named William in this latest trailer, and I think clearly William and Kate and, and the, the mm. Sussexes' relationship with William and Kate is going to come under scrutiny, I think there's a lot of sibling rivalry at the heart of all this. I think Harry... And the fact that his book is called Spare mm. has resented being the spare for a long time, and I think we're going to hear much more on that particular Yeah, well, I agree with you. Um, Araldo, across the pond, um, it seems to me a lot of Americans are as fed up with them as we are. I think you're still hanging in there as being not necessarily a fulsome supporter, <laughs> but a more tolerant uh, observer of all this. What do, you, what do you make of it all? Well, first of all, I want to say I thought of you, Piers, when uh, Harry Kane missed that shot. I really I felt uh, very bad for you and for, uh, for England. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. You know, I, I, in terms of the, the Netflix uh, documentary and Harry and Meghan, uh, you know, and their participation and, you know, their, their ongoing soap opera, I really do feel for them. And I think that the vitriol being heaped on them, the, the scorn is so snobby and snotty. It's having absolutely the opposite effect. I believe that they are generating some sympathy now, not because of what they're doing on the Netflix show, as much as a reaction to the British tabloids and this in, incessant, uh, constant, uh, you know, criticism. There is no doubt in my mind that uh, they, are, they are telling the basic truth. 
Maybe there's a, you know, a shot here that should not have been used, a stock footage, a footage of photog- uh, photographers and so forth. But I think the general truth emerges. They seem sincere. They seem beleaguered. They seem in, in I many cannot ways, believe uh, what I'm you know, hearing. Deeply I've got to be honest with you. You are one of the people I most respect in American television news. You're a hard-bitten journalist. You're a war correspondent. And you've fallen for this guff with these two. Hook, line and sinker. Because they're the least sincere people I think you know, I've ever met in my life. She in particular, cynical. she's you're an too, actress. Too... She's playing a role. She's a good actress. Yeah. My brother, I told you, Piers, I told you how I followed Prince Harry into Helmut Province yeah. in Afghanistan and how the American uh, Marines there and the British personnel that were still there after he had left all, all considered his service there to be honorable, even heroic. No question. So I come, as a war correspondent, I come with that bias. Here's a guy who served his country honorably, put his own life on the line. He married a woman who, for the first time in, in British royal history, uh, was of mixed race. So the issue of racism and here, here Harry's girl straight out of Compton and all that kind of baloney, uh, they have been assailed. Uh, you know, I feel for them because they have been targeted in a way that I feel is very, very unfair. Yeah, but you see, I, mean, I, they would, are I would argue. I, okay, but I would argue they haven't been targeted in the way that I think a lot of Americans have been led to believe they were targeted. There was no racism towards them in the mainstream media in this country. There wasn't. The papers here were euphoric the, about this. The government. Daily Mail. The Daily Mail just did 20 pages on the Netflix document. 20 right. pages. Yeah, but I mean, that's this because. Is yeah, but that's because. This is obsessive. Yeah, but Haraldo, that's because this is a these two. These two sought freedom and privacy in America, and all they've done since they got there is cash in on their royal titles afforded to them by an institution they despise and are trying to ruin, and they're making hundreds of millions well, of dollars I constantly don't despise, trashing I their don't families. Despise when you the talk about Iraq. Iraq around it. My, I don't, and Afghanistan. My, my brother served in Iraq and Afghanistan, Afghanistan, right? And, in fact, my brother-in-law taught William and Harry at Santa's Military Academy. So I, I absolutely respect his military service. But if my brother, notwithstanding his heroic war record in Iraq and Afghanistan, went on national television every 10 minutes, dumping all over my family, that would be a very short conversation next time I saw him. You just don't do that kind of thing to families, do well, you? Well, you know... There, the, where is the kindness? Where is the where uh, is the their sensitivity? kindness? When uh, here you have a here you have a young couple trying to find their way and extraordinary situations with scrutiny that is that is so absolutely intrusive they don't have a moment to breathe. Now he is the spare. He is the, the, the one that was designated to take over. When the, you know, I understand all, all that, and I understand the frustration of that, I mean, uh, uh, theoretically. But I really do believe that your, your lack of kindness to them is laid bare, Piers. You can't have such a visceral uh, viciousness yeah, but here's the irony. Yeah, but Geraldo, here's, here's They're the just irony. trying to pave their Look, way in the world. Here's the irony. My response to them is driven by their serial unkindness and viciousness to the royal family and their deliberate attempts now to not only attack their family, who is a beloved family in this country, but to actually destabilise and potentially bring down the British monarchy. And as a monarchist who loves the royal family I think that that's, and the institution, that is preposterously I think it's their, overstated. It's their unkindness. They're not going to bring down the British monarchy. Well, it might, actually. They're not going to bring might. down the British monarchy. It might. They, they, they will not. How, why? What mechanism will destroy? I tell you why. I tell you why. Because they're this, constant. Uh, this centuries-old institution. Because their constant framing of the royal family as a bunch of nasty, callous racists is beginning to hit home in America. It's hitting home in the Commonwealth. People are believing this. They're not producing any actual evidence to support the racism well, claims. I, all I, the I, all I, the other mental health. When you claims have a, the headline, the headline literally read Harry's new girl almost straight out of Compton. Right. Come on, Piers. Compton, Did, is to, for, you, for your viewers not familiar with this area of, of Los Angeles, yeah. is like Harlem in New York. Well, There's a lot on, of nice places on, on. in Compton, but Compton, generally it's regarded is also as a home known, of rap and, 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 is also and, the place and urban no, problems. Look, I thought so that was an unfortunate headline, but the piece that accompanied it was euphorically praiseworthy. And the truth is she comes from an area about five, six miles from Compton, and Compton produced, as far as the British audience is concerned, produced Serena and Venus Williams. 
Lawrence. So they wouldn't see it in a particularly <coughs> negative way. They think, oh, that's the but place even, the Williams even, system even come making from. Your, even spe- all right, even speaking of Serena and Venus, you, you put it in a racial context. Here she, here she is, a mixed-race actress, uh, you know, who has no familiarity. I mean, she wasn't debriefed by Sarah Ferguson, as far as I know, or by really anybody who, who could guide her into the intricacies what about her own of, husband? of the etiquette and so forth. She was hung out. Well, Harry, I, he, I think he Harry can it. do what Harry can do. But he's a guy. He's, it, it's not like she didn't have someone say, here's how you curtsy. She didn't have someone to say. She and, and by every account, a, they loved Queen no, Elizabeth. No, 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 hang on. They loved and she they literally, honored the, Geraldo, the sovereign you're believing life. the bullshit. She literally got given a massive dossier she explaining did. all these she things. Did. It's now been revealed. Most of what they say in this Netflix thing is completely she untrue. She the Queen's lady in waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if you can't have this. Well, hang on. Well, well, seems to me... Go back to Geraldo. Hang on. Geraldo, just finish that point. It, I think it, you're it falling for the It seems to me that you have a chip on your shoulder toward them, Piers. <laughs> it seems to me that you have an anger inside you that I don't know what the source of it oh, is. Geez. But I think that, for example, to, to allege without proof that this couple is, a, is imperiling the British monarchy is a grotesque overstatement I don't think of it their is. historic significance. Yeah, I don't... I, I, for, because of what? Because of what? Because of the... And, well, and do you spe- deny that the race played any role? Yeah, but do you right, deny that race played any role in the way that they were treated? Specifically, the allegations of racism against the royal family for which they produced zero evidence. All they've done is smear the entire family. Is, and is, it, not a fact, to damage is it not a fact a lot. that... Well, I think that... I, I think that this was a great lesson... For the for not, not just the British people and the Commonwealth, but here in the United States, a great lesson in the need for sensitivity, uh, in, in, in the need for, to have a when you have a progressive step like this, that for the country to embrace them. I think that the, the, Harry would like nothing better than to go and to help. The, the, I heard you were talking with the Labour leaders earlier mm. about the unrest and the, and the economic difficulties. Yeah. I'm positive Harry and Meghan would like to be part of a of a. Oh, of the, Effort, Raldo, do me a favour. They're living in a Californian uh, mansion. People. They've got no interest in helping in the cost of living crisis over here. You've drunk the Sussex Kool-Aid. I, I, I think that if you gave them a... Ch- if, the, if the reception had been a, a bit more understanding, if, they, if you had given them a little have been bit more, more positive of, to a, them. of a fair shake. We couldn't have been more you positive to them. You can't have every tap. How do you feel? How do you, you and I have had our own uh, adventures over our long public lives. How would you feel if every day you woke up, every single tabloid in the country was tearing you apart or was scrutinizing yeah, but Geraldo, you in a way they weren't. Uh, that was uh, almost they weren't. surgical? Actually, in its the coverage was incredibly positive. I remember it well. Yeah, until it wasn't, Piers. The narrative did change. All right, well, but look, it, look, it, look, Geraldo, let me just say to Geraldo, let me just say goodbye to Geraldo. Geraldo, you've been brilliant, as always, as a guest. I love the way you speak your mind. Oh, Piers, I love you're the brilliant. way you never compromise when you have a belief about something. I appreciate you joining the show. Thank you. Very much. All right, let's get a reaction to this. I just want to make the point... A lot of Americans, by the way, will agree with Geraldo. They do, they do. But the narrative (laughs) did change, but it didn't just change because newspaper editors sat there saying, right, now let's put the knife into her. It changed because... Their behaviour changed yes, for the worst. They, they became of very, hypocrites. they became very hypocritical. Preaching about the environment, Absolutely. using private jets, Absolutely. preaching about poverty, throwing half a million dollar and baby by the showers. Way, and by the way, they've made some pretty <laughs> damaging allegations in mm. this. If the trailers anything to go by, mm. I mean, the idea that you know the palace were briefing against them. Well, I know from my experience covering this beat for a long time that their press aides were doing everything they could to keep those negative stories mm. out. I'm, you know, they were so. That's a, there's there's potentially quite damaging allegations in all of this, and and you know, Geraldo mentioned proof. Well, are we going to see any proof? Are we going to see any evidence no, from them over the next three? We're not. Cat, um, what are your thoughts now? If you bumped into Harry, what would you say to him? I just don't know whether I actually even recognise him anymore. I mean, it's changed I, so no, much. I mean, personality-wise, because when I watched him like with the show, I just thought, wow, it's, just, it's almost like. And my mother will really hate me for saying this, but it's almost like she's got, like, a spell over him. Mm. And um, that's why I don't recognise him, because he used to be so, like, down-to-earth and normal, and and there's so so Mm. little of him I actually recognised. You know, Joanna Lumley has come out with an interview with The Times in which she says that 
She's horrified by the way she talks about women specifically, but I think it can extend to men as well. Mm. That you can become too much of a victim. You start to celebrate victimhood. You lose a strength. And she believes that this generation is losing the strength of previous generations. She was talking about women, yeah. but I think it applies to men as well, that there's an almost a celebration of playing a victim. Right, but, I mean, he, he would never in a million years of, um, back in those days have ever been that person to, to do the show. No, I mean, looking at the front pages ever. we've got up here... This is the coverage of when they got engaged. It couldn't have been more euphoric. Same for the wedding. They had 18 months of great press coverage. They got a lot of attention because they're the biggest stars in the country when you marry into the royal family. Anyway, we'll leave it there. There are lots of different views. We'll have all these views on Piers Morgan on Censor. That's the whole point of the show, is that we will invite people to have different views to mine and to challenge mine. That's great. Um, doesn't mean I'm wrong. <laughs> Thank you both very much indeed for coming in. Still ahead, the Nutcracker is among the most popular ballet music ever written, but Ukraine's calling on us to boycott Russian composers like Tchaikovsky until this war is over. Is that right? We'll discuss this with the Ukrainian culture minister next. This is Talk TV. Well, in a moment, I'll speak to the Ukrainian culture minister about what he wants us to do, which is to stop playing music by Tchaikovsky and other great Russian musicians, because he feels that that is a way of punishing Vladimir Putin. 
Um, I don't agree, and I'll say that to him when I speak to him. I think it's the wrong way to respond. That's a good debate. Um, but in the meantime, over here, Cambridge Dictionary has been accused of kowtowing to a woke activist today after it updated its definition of woman to include anyone who identifies as female. Well, I'm joined by Talk TV presenter Richard Tice, who I believe identifies still as male, and Talk TV contributor Paula Roan Adrian, who I'm fairly sure still identifies as a woman. I do. Paula, what is a woman? I didn't think it was that complicated a question. Right. For me, a woman is me. So I was born female with female genitalia. I can give birth, and I know that some women can't, so I'm not necessarily suggesting that that is uh, part of the biological definition. But somebody who definition. puts their hand up and says, I identify as female, a woman, because that's what the dictionary is now defining a woman to also mean. Yeah, and this is where I, I, I start to struggle with when we talk about feelings as opposed to defining words. And this mm. is where I feel that the dictionary has fallen foul of the difference. Well, I mean, you're not the only one who's, who's getting confused by this. This is some of the world's most important people. Look at this. So a woman can have a penis. <laughs> Nick, I'm not. I don't think we can conduct this debate with, you know. Sorry, have I, I get offended this, you in some. No, no, no. It's just. Uh, no, no, no. I just. Can you provide a definition for the word woman? Can I provide a definition? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I can't. You can't? N not in okay. this context. So I'm not a biologist. The of the that woman who can't say what a woman is is now a woman on the Supreme Court of the United States, one of the most powerful people in the world. Richard Tice, it just feels to me like the world has gone completely mad. When yeah. women feel too paralysed to be able to actually enunciate what they believe a woman is for fear of the retribution that may come their way. Well, there's that, but the whole point of a dictionary is that you can rely on it to give you the accurate truth. Right. That's literally the function. Mm. Right. If you're not sure, you go to the dictionary, and the dictionary gives you the truth. So for a dictionary to adopt the latest fashion, the latest mm. trend for fear of upsetting people, mm. I actually think is really serious. I think it's, it's much bigger than this. I actually think that they shouldn't be allowed to get away with this. Mm. I think the government should actually look at injuncting to stop this nonsense. One thing you can be sure of, Piers, this wouldn't be happening in Florida under the governorship of Ron DeSantis. He's he now wouldn't tolerate running it. away with the popularity of the exactly. Republican Party. He wouldn't tolerate no, but it. It's true. He wouldn't, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't accept this. Uh, he may not accept this. And, you know, to an extent, you and I agree. When we're looking at a definition of what is something, then we look at that thing. What we don't do is then attribute a monologue in terms of the ideology behind that thing. We describe that thing. We define that thing. And I don't think that that's what the dictionary has done here. What it's done is it's, it's talking about an ideology. It's talking about a thought process, about a feeling. It's not saying what it but is. But unfortunately, facts don't care about feelings. I'm sorry, they just don't. It's a, it's a bit like Meghan Markle and her truth. Oh, it's like there's no such thing as well, there's no such thing as my truth. There's the truth. There are facts, and then there are people's feelings about facts. But that they're not facts. Well, you're right to say that there is my truth and there is your truth. I accept that, and you're right to say that. Well, only one of them is the actual truth. No, that, that's not always the yes, case. Yes, that no, is the case. No, that's not always well, the case. Well, there's more than one form of the truth. Of course there is. Well, give me an example. When we're talking about give me an example. Feelings. Well, how do, you, how do you define what a woman is, Piers? Differently to a woman is do? a woman born to a female biological body. Boom. But that's a different definition. That's, it. that's a different definition to what a scientist might have, to, uh, to what it somebody a, who is... It's what the dictionary, until this week, always said a <laughs> woman one was somebody born to a female biological body. There are two sexes, male and female. That's it. The whole point of a dictionary is that it doesn't have feelings. It doesn't get confused. Yes, right. Now we have a dictionary it is the endorsing fact. It is the feelings. Line. Right, but now they're endorsing feelings, right? I feel like... I did this on Good Morning Britain once. We had somebody on trying to defend the BBC educating kids of 12 that there were over 100 genders, including yeah. astrogender, yeah. which is an affinity with the stars and planets. Yeah. So I said, fine, by that criteria, if we can identify as anything we like, I am a two-spirit penguin because I walk a bit like a penguin. I have the same carnivorous diet as a penguin. Uh, I think penguins are much beloved 
figures in this country. Again, a big tick in the box. So I had a lot of affinity with penguins, and I like to have various spirits, so I'm a two-spirit penguin. All hell broke loose. How dare you mock self-identity? How dare you say you're a two-spirit penguin? Had I said I am an astrogender because I look at the stars and planets and feel all woozy, that would be the BBC's way of educating kids about what they can identify as. It is nonsense. It, it is nonsense to you. Yes. It's and nonsense to, any, to and by you. Way, to but most it, people. But it, but it's, to most people, but it Paula. To most people. I'm not, I'm not sure that's right, because, you know, we haven't counted. What, what we're talking about and what I think you have to accept, Piers, and the people who want to shout at me and want to use mm. the word woke as, 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 as some kind of dirty word, is you're not listening to those people. Well, woke used to be an awareness of social and racial injustice. It's still what woke, is. No, no, what woke is. Is, no, no. Is. What woke has become, for most of the wokies, is a form of fascism, where they think if, if anyone disagrees with them, when they come out with this nonsense about what a woman is, for example, they must be abused, shamed, cancelled, driven out of their jobs and terrorise, as we saw with J.K. Rowling. But why who tried are you attributing... To, who I don't even like, by the way. She's always been damn rude to me. But on this, she's right. But why are you attributing the title of woke activist to those people? They're purely... They're activists. Because they identify... Them them normally activists. identify in their, in their Twitter biography as woke and also hashtag be kind. They are the least kind people in the history of planet Earth. They're vicious. They're nasty. They're fascist. The very thing they like to pretend they hate most, that is what they are. They want to basically indoctrinate everyone to agree with everything they say. That's it. And I'm no not, deviation. I'm not going to disagree with you in Thank terms you. of... Thank okay. you. On that note, we'll go back to a little commercial <laughs> break because Paul O'Ron Agent has finally agreed and I'm right about everything. We'll finish. Uh, after we'll the break, finish. should we be boycotting Tchaikovsky because he's Russian? Well, after a Ukraine minister called for the West to boycott all Russian culture till the end of the war. We'll discuss that after the break.
Piers Morgan on Censored Arts this evening. Ukraine's Cultures Minister. Uh, unfortunately, we've got technical issues with him. He's in Paris, I think, and we can't actually get the line-up. So we're going to take this debate. If we don't get him tonight, we'll get him back on tomorrow. Um, Richard and Paula, it's an interesting debate, this. He's come out very strongly. He wrote a big piece in The Guardian. Uh, Alexander Kachenko is Ukraine's culture minister, calling for all music by Tchaikovsky to be paused, saying that Putin sees Russian culture as a tool and even a weapon to attack liberal values and has indeed, of course, destroyed many monuments of Ukrainian arts and culture. I feel uncomfortable about this, I've got to be honest. I don't think it's the right response. You can understand why he's saying it, why he feels it so deeply and passionately, but I don't think it is the right response. And the truth is it's not actually going to achieve anything. What we've really got to focus on is, I think, actually what we've been doing pretty well, which is giving them the, the, the arms, the weapons, uh, to fight like, mm. like, like absolute Trojans. But, uh, but I understand his, his angst with, frankly anything with the name Russian, the sense of Russian, and so you see why he's... I mean, why Paula, he's himself there. we've heard this about sport, you know, yes. and they have been punished, yes. the Russians. They yes. weren't allowed to, uh, to compete at Wimbledon, for example. Yes. Um, is there the a Olympics? difference between sport and cultural, you know, arts, for example? Is there a difference ideologically between a boycott of sport compared to Tchaikovsky? I can, I can understand why you're uncomfortable, but I have to disagree with you, because what we're looking at is the absolute desecration of not only a country and its people, but that include its culture and... All right, art. let me ask you a question. So when we illegally invaded Iraq in 2003, this country, OK, and we were with the Americans, would the correct response have been to that illegal invasion, which is what I believe it was, which led to the slaughter of a million people, would it have been correct then to have boycotted all the music of the Beatles and all the music of Elvis Presley? as a punishment? And if not, what's the difference? I could have understood if that's what the Iraqi people chose to do. And I could have understood... If they come out and said, if, if, a, if an Iraqi leader come out and said, the world must boycott the Beatles and Elvis Presley, what would the reaction have been? I, I could have understood that, Piers. That's my answer. Of course I yeah, could have Yeah, but I can tell you that. what the reaction would and have been. Everyone would have said, forget it. And not I, happening. Well, they may well so have said that. So the there's a bit like all the double standards it. over the uh, Qatar World Cup. There's immoral hypocrisy, I think, at bay here, right? But there's a big difference. Because if you're talking about current sporting teams, current sporting uh, personalities, mm. as opposed to someone from, from way back in history. Mm. So I, I think that, for me, is, is the dividing line between the two. You've got, you've got what's going on currently, and that's sanctions, and that's current boycotts, but actually um, making a sort of a, a gesture against uh, the historical... Well, Tchaikovsky, I think, died 60-odd years before yeah, so, Putin was even born or something. Already. I mean, I can't remember so what, the, country still what makes the stat was. Money. The country still makes money from this, and that's what this is about, Richard. It's about making money. It's interesting. My mother just messaged me completely randomly. I wasn't expecting this at all. Uh, she went to see a ballet, uh, the, the Nutcracker, with, with a Ukrainian woman and her daughter this week. Mm. And she said she did cringe a bit when it was Darcy Bustle apparently introduced it. It was a ballet that obviously came from Russia, uh, raving about the fact that it came from Russia. Mm. It did great with her. Mm. And maybe that is what a lot of people feel. Maybe people do feel, you know what, actually, if Putin's desecrating art throughout Ukraine, destroying theatres, banning people from doing what they love, then why should we celebrate any form of Russian culture until this is over? I do understand and, it. And I don't we, really agree with the argument because I think it sets a very weird precedent, and which we, we didn't adopt ourselves. But we can take McDonald's out of Russia. We can take Nike out of Russia. Yeah. Then surely we, sh we should be taking Tchaikovsky well, you and mentioned All right, you mentioned food, but you just got time for Brooklyn Beckham's latest <laughs> cooking <laughs> lesson on American <laughs> television. This is where he does a... I think it's a tuna and cucumber sandwich. Here's Brooklyn Beckham. So what he gets, he gets a bit of raw tuna. He puts a bit of stuff on it. He gets some a bit of egg. He gets some uh, cucumber, puts it in some sesame seeds, and then he puts it in a pan. And he calls himself a chef. <laughs> now, it's a bit like identifying as a woman if you're not born to a female body. He might identify as a chef, but this is the kind of thing I knock up when I'm on my own at home, and I'm not a chef. Am I right? No. It, I mean, you, Piers, come on, you just sound bitter now. This you is think a he's young, a good chef? I, I think he's a young man who is trying his best to help If he people. wasn't called Brooklyn Beckham, would he be doing 
his tuna cucumber special on American television. But that's like saying, if my dad wasn't a famous journalist, should I become a journalist? Piers, we all want to be able to follow in the footsteps of our parents. Richard? And... He's trying, but come on. I mean, <laughs> you know what? He's trying. Actually, you can leave it there. He's trying. <laughs> Good to see you both. Thank you both very much. That's it from me. Uh, keep it uncensored. Good night.